Agent Hogan hadn't seen what had grabbed the commander. The sounds of blood-curdling screams had made his eyes instinctively snap shut. Hogan kept both eyes tightly closed, nothing but darkness blotting out his vision even as the desperate, gravelly-voiced yells of the commander filled his ears. Then, suddenly, there was a scream, one that was abruptly cut off. With a heavy thud, something dropped to the ground, close enough to Agent Hogan's feet that he could feel the vibrations of it hitting the floor through his boots. It was the commander, completely still and silent. Even though he'd been trained to look danger in the eye, Agent Hogan still didn't open his eyes, not even for a split second. This was the first time that anything like this had ever happened, and in the panic and confusion, his natural survival instincts had overridden the SCP Foundation's various rules and protocols in his head. And right now, something was telling him not to look. That something was shifting and moving just beyond Agent Hogan's eyelids. He could hear a shuffling as something much taller than an average human lumbered around. It had been wailing before, shrieking in uncontrollable and inconsolable despair, but now its cries had lowered to a soft, sobbing whimper. When someone's eyes are closed, they aren't completely cut off from the world around them. Just being able to see doesn't entirely dull a person's awareness. Most people have a kind of sense, a spatial alert that tells them what's nearby even if they can't see it. And in this particular moment, Agent Hogan's was going haywire. The thing, the thing beyond his closed eyes was moving towards him, so close he could feel its warm, rancid breath on his skin. Just knowing it was so close, hearing it breathe and sob gently, sensing it standing so close to him, it made the agent's already pounding heart rate start to climb. He could feel beads of sweat crawling down the side of his face as the creature leaned in closer. It almost felt like it was trying to goad him into opening his eyes. Go on, just take a peek, came a nagging, gnawing voice at the back of Hogan's mind. He couldn't help it. It was a natural human response to be curious. But as intriguing of a sight as it might have been, the creature was far more terrifying. Hogan had no idea what horror he'd be faced with if he even opened his eyes for a second. Little did he know, forcing himself not to look, whether out of fear or pure survival instinct, had saved the agent's life. He could sense the creature turn and start to slink off, getting further away again as it lumbered around a corner on its elongated legs. Still, Agent Hogan waited a little longer before opening up his eyes again, just to be safe. It had all started around a month earlier, when the SCP Foundation had discovered a potential anomaly was being housed by a group known as the Department of Abnormalities. You see, back then, the SCP Foundation wasn't quite the sprawling, ginormous anomaly containment organization some might be familiar with. It was far from being in its infancy at this point in time either, but the Foundation was only just beginning to expand its collection of dangerous and unusual anomalies. They had received word of an anomaly that was being held in a facility in Stuttgart, Germany, where Department of Abnormalities personnel had gone to great lengths to secure it. However, despite all the measures they put in place, this creature was able to escape and didn't leave a single survivor in its wake after breaking free. And so, being unfamiliar with this kind of situation, the SCP Foundation had to decide what the best course of action would be. The Foundation dispatched a retrieval team, codenamed Zulu-9A, to the facility that the creature had broken free from. From the location in Stuttgart, Zulu-9A was able to track the anomaly's movements to an undisclosed mountainous region. It was believed that this area was either the creature's natural habitat, where it had initially been captured, or that the mountain at least closely resembled the place that the anomaly would recognize as home. Flying aboard a chopper, the Zulu-9A team assumed they could simply approach the creature and calmly coerce it long enough for them to capture and escort it back to base. It turned out they were very, very wrong. As their chopper landed nearby and the retrieval team closed in on the creature, the captain of Zulu-9A turned to talk to a Foundation doctor that had accompanied the unit. That one serendipitous action might have saved his life because it meant he wasn't looking at the anomaly. A sudden, intense shriek rang out as the creature started crying, 
turning towards the rest of the approached retrieval unit. In a panic, they pulled their triggers, weapons erupting into a hail of deafening gunfire, but it had no effect. The creature dashed towards them, shrugging off every oncoming attack completely unscathed. But the Zulu 9A team weren't so well defended. By the time the captain turned back around, the creature had already vanished, seemingly able to move much faster than first anticipated. Maybe once they'd taken a look at it, the retrieval team thought that the creature's long, disproportionate limbs would make its movements clumsy and cumbersome. Not that a single one of them was left standing to verify that. The captain was left alone and stunned. He hadn't seen what had happened to his team, only the aftermath. And it wasn't a pretty sight. Before long, backup arrived in the form of Zulu 9B's team. With the help of this secondary unit, the captain was able to eventually capture the creature and remand it into SCP Foundation containment. How? By placing a bag over its head. His theory was, if it couldn't see the retrieval team, it couldn't attack them. And while this strategy might have worked, he was only half right. Of course, the SCP Foundation's mandate has always been to contain and study the anomalies that it encounters, and this was all the more prevalent during these earlier days of the organization. So naturally, once the creature had seemingly been captured and secured, a group of overzealous and eager scientists were quick to step in so that they could closely examine the anomaly. And for a time, they were able to work with little obstruction. They could determine the basic details about the creature's physiology and have that information logged in its very own file on the SCP Foundation's internal database. But one scientist made a very fatal mistake during those early tests and studies. Perhaps because the Foundation had already captured the creature and secured it within the walls of its own facility, they believed it posed no further threat to personnel anymore, that it couldn't hurt to remove the bag and take a closer look. The very instant the bag was removed, chaos broke loose. It was as if someone had lit the fuse of a firework, only for it to explode before they could rush to a safe enough distance away. Not only were the scientists studying the creature horrified by the sight of its grotesque, wide-jawed face, but they were all seconds away from meeting the same grim and grisly fate as the retrieval team sent to capture it. Now they had seen its face, and the monster was loose within the Foundation. At that particular point in time, the Foundation's early mistakes, this kind of thing was unprecedented. It had never happened before, not once, and nobody knew what to do. Most of the anomalies they had encountered so far were benign, either harmless oddities, passive and non-hostile creatures or artifacts with a few strange or unexplained properties, but with no real sentience to speak of. But this was a ferocious abomination, intent on causing harm to the Foundation's own staff. So someone needed to act, and do so fast. A handful of armed Foundation agents happened to be on site at the time. Security officers Hendricks, Hogan, and Stevens, as well as Sutton, the surviving captain from the Zulu 9A retrieval team. The second that the creature was seen and began retaliating against those that had seen its face, deafening alarms began to blare. That was all the warning they would get. There were no special containment procedures yet. No protocol or standard procedure for something like this. The Foundation didn't even have a term for the situation that was going on. Although after today, they would. This was the SCP Foundation's first ever containment breach. Given that he'd been involved in retrieving the creature that was now on the loose, Captain Sutton took lead of the small group, coordinating them as their de facto commander. Don't worry, we just need to get another bag over its head and get it back into containment. He instructed as calmly and confidently as he could, given the tense circumstances. This thing is highly aggressive, but if you stay out of sight, it won't come after you. Corners and stay frosty. We'll split into twos and fan out. Should have more of a chance of catching him that way. Little did Sutton realize his misguided advice would cost him and others their lives. Hendricks and Steven stumbled across the creature first, poking their heads around a corner. They spotted the tall, wry, humanoid shape passing along the corridor that ran parallel to the one they stood in. The two agents saw the creature, but as far as they could tell, it hadn't seen them. But that didn't matter. Just as they both turned down the corner, ready to ambush the anomaly, the towering, spindly form of the creature suddenly appeared behind them, screeching as it attacked. Hearing the sound of the others falling prey to the monster, 
Captain Sutton and Agent Hogan rushed towards the source of their fellow agent's screams. The de facto commander of the group rushed a few paces ahead, confident that he knew how to get the upper hand against the creature. Trailing behind him, Agent Hogan had been swept up in the panic of the whole situation. He had no idea what the creature was, only that half of the retrieval team sent to capture it had all died. Their weapons were useless against it, which made the gun Hogan gripped in his trembling fingers feel unreassuringly ineffective. Sutton turned a corner down the corridor ahead, and that had been when he locked eyes with the creature. Seeing its face for the first time, he hadn't even caught a proper glimpse of it when he'd managed to capture it in the mountains. But now he had seen it, and it knew. From around the corner, unable to see Sutton or the monster, Agent Hogan let the panic get the better of him and closed his eyes, an action that had unknowingly saved his life. Once the monster had passed him by and Agent Hogan had dared to open his eyes again, his mind started racing. It had seen him, that much he was certain of. Even with his eyes closed, he had sensed just how close to him the creature had gotten to him. It had to have seen him, and yet he was still alive. Sutton had said that it would attack anyone that it saw, unless Sutton had got it all wrong. The creature wasn't attacking anyone it looked at, it was going after anyone who looked at it. It was learning that key difference that allowed Agent Hogan to gain the upper hand on the creature. However, he quickly realized that the number of people in the facility was rapidly dwindling. The longer the anomaly was able to roam free, the more Foundation personnel would see its face and fall victim to its rage. Agent Hogan realized what he would have to do, send out a message to the SCP Foundation higher-ups that this anomaly was only attacking anyone who looked at it. Then, he sealed himself in the chamber where the scientists had been examining the creature. They'd filmed the examination. All Hogan had to do was watch part of the footage where the bag was removed and look at the anomaly's face. The monster took care of the rest. Traveling at impossible speeds, SCP-096 appeared in the room behind Agent Hogan. Ever since, the SCP Foundation has poured innumerable resources into ensuring they have enough personnel who are specifically trained to deal with containment breaches. Some will even tell you that it was this first incident that led to the idea of mobile task forces, teams that the Foundation can deploy within moments to respond to anomalies breaking out of their containment. Of course, who really knows if that is true? Maybe half of it actually happened, and the rest was built off rumors and hearsay. If you sign up to join one of the SCP Foundation's mobile task forces nowadays, then perhaps your commanding officer will tell you this story during your basic training. It could be that they're trying to intimidate you, or just re-emphasize how important the role of the MTFs within the Foundation is. One thing is for sure, though. Anyone assigned to guard SCP-096's chamber knows to close their eyes in the event of another containment breach. Now go and check out SCP-096 The Shy Guy, SCP Animation, and SCP-096's Sad End for more.